thank you for joining us for a special Halloween themed episode of Lackawanna Pastimes this afternoon. I'm Sarah Puccini, the Assistant Director of the Lackawanna Historical Society. Today we're joined by Jess Sorrenti, the Director of Community Engagement of the Albright Library in Scranton, and by John Belucha, who is the one of the founders of the Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours. John and his wife, Carrie Ann, have been doing paranormal investigations um, originally as a hobby and then involving, um, involving others since 2004. They established Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours in 2018. Uh, Jess will give us a little bit of a history of the Albright Library, uh, some of its, its founders, some of its um, backstory of the building itself. And then John will talk about some of the investigations that the group has done um, themselves and with others in the Albright Library, so we can find out perhaps who might still be there in the Albright Library. Uh, so Jess, I'll turn the program over to you. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. So hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to see all your faces. Some of you I do recognize, I've seen you before in other venues, so it's nice to see you again. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, uh, my name is Jessica. I work here at the Scranton Public Library. I've been here for about six years now. Um, but the uh, ghost tour started just over a year ago uh, um, in the planning process and then COVID hit and all that good stuff. Um, but I'm gonna just walk you through a brief um, background history about the Albright first, and then we'll break into, you know, more discussion about the ghosts. Um, but first of all, in order to talk about the building, I do have to talk about the man who made it possible, who is John Albright. So John Albright was born in 1848 to Joseph and Elizabeth Albright. Now, Joseph and Elizabeth had a homestead on the land that is what the Albright building is right now. Um, so they lived there. John um, actually wasn't born there, but they eventually grew up moved to Scranton at a very young age, grew up here, um, lived in the house in Scranton here with his three other siblings, and they are Jenny, Maria, and Henry. So like I said, Albright grew up here. He had a wonderful childhood. Um, when it was time to go to college, he actually went to Williston Academy in Massachusetts um, and then graduated from the Rennesleer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York in mining engineering. So when he came back to Scranton, he decided to get into the wholesale of coal with his business partner, Andrew Langdon. Now at that time, as we all know, coal was huge and especially in Scranton with the coal mines. Um, but he got into the wholesale, which is you know where you're making the Uber dollars. So um, what happened was Andrew and John Albright were actually working for the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company. And that company started to move its headquarters to DC. So they moved along with it. Um, and while they worked for um, <clears throat> the Coal and Iron Company, uh, Albright actually married Andrew's sister, Harriet. And uh, they started their family down in DC. And then naturally as all things happen, the coal company decided to move uh, Buffalo, New York, um, where a lot of its shipping coal was gonna come through out of out of Buffalo and then dispersed throughout the country. So Albright moved his family to Buffalo, New York. Now, if you do visit Buffalo, um, you'll see a lot of different memorials for the Albright family. Um, they were very philanthropic throughout their lives. Uh, the house that they lived in in Buffalo, they actually built themselves. He actually you know, constructed it. So um, what happened was he did so well at the wholesale of coal that he was actually able to retire at the age of 40. And he traveled through Europe and went to Egypt and he came back and he grew really bored. So he went back to work. And part of that work was a lot of the philanthropic um, ventures that he went into. So in 1890, Albright had penned a letter to the Scranton Board of Trade. And he, in that letter, he asked for the right to build Scranton's first public library. Um, and it would be where the Albright homestead stood. So at this point, both of his parents, Joseph and Elizabeth had passed not too long ago, within a couple years of each other, his, his father passed away first and then his mom. And the, home, the homestead was still there. So he actually asked for that to be knocked down and the building be made in their memory. Um, and him and his siblings signed the letter and it was approved and construction began in 1891. It officially opened to the public in 1893 on June 1st. So in the construction of the building itself, 
if you've seen it, it's very castle-like looking French Gothic. Um, he spared no expense. So he projected that he spent about $25,000. He spent $125,000 to build this library. And that was back then. It is based on the Musée de Cluny, uh, which is a building in Paris, France. It's a museum. So if you look up pictures of the Musée de Cluny, you will see the, the gables and some of the Gothic architecture are very similar. Um, so like I said, all that beautiful woodwork um, went into the library and it opened up to the public officially on June 1st. So what happened was obviously a collection of books had to be donated. So throughout the years, um, several prominent Scrantonians have donated collections to the library. Um, and we have different portraits and um, plaques around the library um, to recognize their donation. And the first director was Henry Carr and his wife's name was Edith. And the two of them were very instrumental in actually the uh, formulating the American Library Association. Um, both of them served and both of them actually helped formulate some of the committees. And they were super dedicated to this library. Edith was pretty much his unofficial assistant to the library. And um, we do have pictures of them in our collection, and actually some of their personal letters to each other as well. And along with them were some of the first librarians who worked here. And if you've ever watched or read um, Anne of Green Gables, Anne with a knee, they got the puff sleeves. Imagine that fashion, and that's what the first librarians wore. Um, so the way the library was organized was on the main floor, you had a lot of study tables um, to your left, and then there was, you know, the main <clears throat> circulation desk. In the office where I am right now, I'm in the admin office. This actually used to be the children's room, the children's section. So uh, if you ever come in here, you'll see a, a divider wall um, to, it would be my left <laughs> or your right. Um, and that separates our director's office. Well, that wall used to never be here when it was originally built. And there was just one big room that was the children's room, children's wing. Uh, later in years, around 1934, there was a, a librarian who worked her named Elizabeth Arthur. She was very artistic. She actually wanted to study art in France, never got the opportunity to go, was offered a job as an illustrator for National Geographic and couldn't go due to family concerns. Um, but while she was here working in the library, she did paint the murals that you'll see above me here um, in the children's wing. And they depict different historical um, moments in our history and also children's literature. So to my left is Little Boy Blue, and above me is Paul Revere, and across from me, I know you can't see it, is a young Abe Lincoln. Um, and as you come in here, you'll see a lot more. You'll see Lassie, George Washington, all these really cool parts of, of our fairy tales and history. So she had painted these because before that, there really wasn't anything distinguishing this as a children's area. Um, and there is restoration done to them to make sure that they are preserved correctly. Unfortunately though, Elizabeth never really um, grew to be known as a, as a well-known artist, except for her work here in the library. Um, and there was an article written, I think in the eighties in the Scranton Times about her, they interviewed her niece and she talks about working here more. So very interesting. Um, so like I said, so on the main floor, you would have your study tables. The stacks area, which you can now all go in to browse for fiction, any books that you want, nonfiction, that used to be off limits to patrons. And it used to only be the staff members who could go back there. So you couldn't just browse books. You'd have to go up to the, li to the librarian at the desk and say, I'm looking for a book on geography or whatever it is. And they'd have to go back and find the book for you. And of course, as time evolved, and the changes of the library evolved, that became what we know as the stack wing. People could go back there. They could search the library card catalog um, before it was digital <laughs> and, and check everything out. Upstairs is a really interesting story um, for me because that's where I feel most of the change has happened in the library. 
Upstairs is what we now call to the right is our reference section, okay? Um, that's where you have your public computers, you can print, fax, there's still microfilm machines there. You can check out you know, newspapers on microfilm, obituaries, local history. That room was actually not always a reference room. There was actually no floor there. So um, in an old picture, and I believe I have it, let me just double check my notes. Yeah, do you mind if I share my screen real quick? Go right ahead, Okay, that's fine. Awesome. So very quickly, if I can go here. Okay, so this is actually on the main floor and looking up, you see right up here, there's no floor. So that's, this is where the reference wing is now and there'd be a floor here, a ceiling, and there's not. So up here, it was just a balcony. And the first librarians would walk around the balcony. There were book stacks. Um, with reference books that people could could use. Um, and they would take what books you want and you can sit down and read them, but not up here. You'd have to go back downstairs. I'm gonna stop sharing that one. I wonder if I can find my other one. I have another one that's good. There's another good picture. So you can see the two floors. So what happened is as time went on, we needed that space. So we filled in the floor. I don't know the exact date, but we did fill in the floor so that we could use the space more for the reference books as the library role changed a little bit and adapted and we had to um, basically add more material. We had to add more books. People were doing research papers. The technical school was right across the street from us. Uh, so a lot of students would come in and use it to research. Uh, but something interesting um, that we'll mention later on with our uh, ghost adventures about the balcony area up top. I'm going to stop sharing now. So that's our reference wing. And now to the left, if you go upstairs, is the Henkelman room. Um, and that is named after one of our current board members, Mr. Jim Henkelman. Uh, him and his family have always been uh, huge supporters of the library. Um, and recently we went through a renovation where we brought that room back to what its original purpose was, which is a lecture hall. Um, during, I believe, 60s through early 2000s, and even while I was originally here in 2015, it was used as a computer wing as well um, for people. And also uh, there were study tables there, there were reference books. And during the renovation that we had in 17 and 18, we wanted to return it back to its original purpose because we really lacked a good space for having lectures, having programs. So we went back to the original uh, drawing board of, of what you know John Albright wanted, and we made it back into the lecture hall. And Mr. Henkelman, he donated money to help furnish it. So we got those really nice gray tables that we can move around and all good things like that. Um, but I mentioned it because that room has a lot of interesting woodwork that we actually uncovered when we renovated the room because there were bookshelves hiding some of the beautiful wooden scroll work there. So I um, just wanted to mention that in case you do come in, you can always come in and look around by the way. <clears throat> so that's pretty much in a nutshell, the <clears throat> Albright Memorial Library and the changes that it's gone through. Um, very quickly, because we'll mention it, the children's library next door, um, was originally a Christian science church um, built back in 1911, I believe. Yes, double checking my notes there in my head. Um, so yeah, so originally Christian science church. And then what happened in the 80s was basically the congregation got so small that they couldn't afford to stay in that building. And so they actually sold it to the county, Lackawanna County. The congregation moved um, down, I think it was North Washington Ave. And at the same time, the Lackawanna County Library System was being formed, and they actually allowed the system to buy it, and they gave it to our, our Scranton Public Library so that it could be used for the children's wing. It could be it's actually a standalone children's library. And that's because if you'll uh, do any research, there were several articles in the Scranton Times that came out throughout the decades complaining about the space or lack of space in the children's wing here at the Albright. Um, 
they'd be having a summer reading program going on as other students were studying. And um, as other people are you know, looking for materials and the line would be out the door with parents and kids signed up for programs. Um, so the space was just outgrowing you know, what the community needed. Um, and what I think is just so funny is that throughout this time, there were so many people who kept saying, oh, there's no way that the library, Scranton Library will ever have that building next door. They'll never have that Christian Science building. Never, never, never. And they did, they ended up getting it, but it was through the county and it was because of the Lackawanna County Library system that we were able to make that happen. So I do wanna put that out there because it's, it's important. Um, so the uh, Children's Library, um, when you do go in real quick, I'll just mention this, you go up the stairs through the front entrance and you go in, um, it's very echoey, right? It's very loud, good acoustics. That's what they, that's why, because it was a church. Um, so when you see a lot of the hanging decorations, the clouds, the Mary Poppins and all that, that was to try to soften and deaden the sound. <laughs> I don't think it really worked too much, um, but that was the purpose. Um, and if you are looking straight forward into the library and you'll see like there's that neat like crisscross pattern wooden paneling on top, that's actually where the organ used to be. And then the organist would sit underneath that little alcove and play. Um, and then where the, the little tables are and the stacks of books, that's where the um, pews were, where people would sit. So yeah, so very cool building. Um, I think that wraps up my very quick, I tried to make a quick, <laughs> quick historical tour of the Albright and Children's Library. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, for that for that overview. Um, again, if you haven't been in, in the library, even if you're not going to check out a book, please do go in there just to, to check it out. It is one of the most beautiful buildings in Scranton. Um, and like James Albright, I also aspire to retire at 40 and travel Egypt until I'm bored. Um, yeah. I don't think it's going to work out well for me, but I'm hopeful. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that how that goes. Um, I'm going to turn the program over now to John um, to talk a little bit about um, anyone who may still be lingering in the Albright Library um, from their paranormal investigations. So John, I'll turn it over over to you now. Oh, John, your, your microphone is still muted. Can you hear okay, me now? now you're All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a first for me, and I must say I'm a little bit nervous, and I'm not sure really why, because we do speaking all the time at different locations, but it's just a different format. So uh, if I stutter, please bear with me, because I'm a little bit nervous about it. Um, we've had some great results at the Albright. You know, we uh, our, our first one was in April of 2021. You know, we came and did an investigation, and right out the gate, it was interesting. Uh, we had a lot of activity, and I don't know if it's because we gave the spirits a voice, so to speak. Uh, maybe it was their first time. I, I don't believe anybody else has ever investigated that building. So if there were any spirits there, we gave them their voice for the first time to be heard. And it was very, very active um, through many different techniques that we do. Um, and that could be you know, like through simple stuff as a K2 meter, a K2 meter picks up electromagnetic frequencies and it could show a sign of a presence of a spirit if they can come over and touch it and manipulate it. And the way that it shows us that they're there is it lights up in sequence of lights from green to yellow uh, to red, red being the strongest presence. So, you know, the first thing that we always like to do is introduce ourselves and talk to them as if they are still alive. And we talk to them as how we want to be spoken to. So we always go through and we introduce ourselves and we tell them what kind of equipment we do have and what they could do to manipulate it. And the moment that I asked that, I said, if you are in this room and would like to communicate, please come over and touch this device that I have in my hand. And sure as, well, it, it did. It went right up to yellow, not the highest point. And I said, could you come a little bit closer? Could you get a little bit stronger? And it went right up to red. So I said, could you turn it off for me? Shut right down completely. Bring it back to red, went right back to red. So we were getting intelligent responses to the questions that we were asking uh, with our first piece of equipment that we used. Um, but what really got interesting um, for us is uh, the most memorable or even profound experience actually was in the basement. Uh, down in the basement, we did the spirit box session uh, where you, we can actually use a modified radio, which sweeps uh, stations at a high rate of speed and creates that white noise that that white noise generation, and we hope that they can use those frequencies uh, to use their voice and talk to us. So being down there, we actually had one gentleman uh, sitting there. He stood up, and a voice came through on this radio, 
and says, where are you going? The moment that he stood up and said, where are you going? So he's like, he told me, he said, well, I see as if there was some sort of shadow figure down at the end of the hall, looking back from the way we came in. And I don't remember the name of the actual office itself, but it's down when you go down into the basement and you go past the, uh, the vending machines that are there, the furthest office you can go to, there's about five um, different desks there, five or six associates sit down there. So that's what we were doing that. So we're looking back at the hallway out and a gentleman told me, he said, I swear I saw an apparition of some sort down at the end of the hallway. So that's really, really interesting. Well, it only took a brief second. I think everybody else also saw that same apparition as it appeared, it appeared around the corner. So when he saw it, it was standing at the end, but the disappeared went to its left. And there's like this little area that goes to like their boiler room. So it, it kind of went off to the side. He stood up and I said, is it still down there? And he goes, well, I don't see it right now. But then it took a brief second. It's almost like it popped out of the corner and looked at all of us and kind of disappeared. But what was interesting about it is he was then directed at one point what to do. So as he, he started walking down the hallway, we heard these voices coming through saying, that's far enough, stop. So he stopped. And I told him, as we're hearing the voices, like we're yelling it to him, because he's a little bit ways away from us right now. He's about 40, 50 feet away from us. I said, it said to stop. So he stopped. And then it said, turn around. So he turned around. He started to walk back towards us. So when he started walking back towards us, there's vending machines, which would be to his right. If you look to the left, there is an elevator door. So that elevator door is where they told him to stop. When he did, they said, look left. He looked left. And there's another little room off to the left there, which is like the intake area for the library. It, only, it directed him to go into that room. They were getting the voices, go left, stop, come in. And he told me that he saw something in the back corner of that room. He said he couldn't make it out. You know, he, he said it was just some sort of like, he said, he didn't use the word mist. I forget what word he used, but he said, it's almost as if there was like a veil there, which was very translucent. It was black. And he noticed something off in that corner, but it disappeared just like that. But I was asking the questions as he was in there. So he couldn't hear us. I'm asking the spirit, I said, could you continue to talk to us uh, and tell us what you need? And they said, I'm behind this door. I'm in the corner. So I got up and I walked over to the gentleman because I wanted to see what was going on in that room. Um, the room that we were in, there's a filing cabinet um, against this one door that we could not open, uh, unfortunately, because I thought it would have been really interesting if we were able to. I don't know what it would have happened, um, but we sure did want to try to open that up to see what was going on. So most we were able to do is go over and knock on it uh, to see if we can get any kind of response. Uh, we, we weren't able, we weren't successful with that. And we lost transmission with whoever was speaking to us um, that evening. But as time went on, the other group that was with us, were, I, I was stationed down there the whole night because um, we did the spirit box session. So one other group wasn't, they weren't directed to go down there, but the one lady grabs a hold of my arm. She goes, hey, she goes, I swear I just saw something walk down that hallway. I said, well, that's pretty interesting, is it? Because the last group, uh, actually two groups prior to yours, we had a gentleman said that he saw the same thing. So she goes, well, it's, it's there. It's definitely there. So we all turned and waited and, and watched and, and asked that the police come out and interact with us and talk to us somehow, some way. Well, we didn't see it again. But what we did see at the end of that hallway, it goes straight down and you go to the right and then there's the boiler room. So the light was on in that boiler room, which was shining into the hallway briefly. What we all did see was that light go from brightness to dark as if something passed in front of it and closed off that light down there. So there's definitely um, a spirit down there. There's definitely a, a presence of someone uh, that tries to make communication almost every time that we're there. Uh, we always get some sort of indication that somebody sees something or if they don't see it, they said, for whatever reason, look at my arm hair. It's straight up as we walk down this hallway. There's a presence of something down there. Uh, one of the groups um, who knew nothing about it either, this is like several months later, we're sitting there doing a spirit box session. And he goes, you know, 
I swear something just peeked around the corner and looked at us all and then bolted back and got out of there. I'm like, well, it makes sense. I said, because we've had this happen. So there's probably a good, let's see, four groups. So we had at least 20 eyewitnesses of the same um, shadow figure um, spirit that came out to kind of want to play a little bit. So we had some pretty interesting experiences down there. We also had an experience um, up in the reference room uh, up on the top floor to the right it was Jessica was explaining you get to the top there where all the microfilm is on that room. Uh, we did this technique where we use our dowsing rods. Um, and so someone would hold a dowsing rod and these dowsing rods would we'd ask questions, series of questions. We wanted to get first thing you want to do is just say we have these dowsing rods here that you're able to come over and touch and manipulate and move in a certain direction uh, to the answer to the questions that we're asking. You can answer us in a yes, no format. But we make it known at the time we want it to say yes, cross the rods or no, cross the rod, whatever it may be. You just make it known what you want your response to be. So we started doing that. We weren't really getting much, weren't really getting much doing that. So we tried something else where we take these same dowsing rods and we'll have somebody say the alphabet. And I told them, I said, if there are any spirits here tonight, what I'd like you to do is we're going to say the alphabet. And I want you to tell me what your name is for these dowsing rods. When we get to the letter, I want you to take the rods and cross them. So we're going. And I had a person holding the rods. And the one lady was A. Wait a couple seconds. B, C, D, E. We got the H, started spelling out this name that started with an H. Then it was A. It was, well, it wound up being Harriet. Well, what's interesting about that, the name Harriet, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, but that is John Albright's uh, wife. Her name yep. is Harriet. Uh, so nobody knew that prior to the investigation. I did not know that. It was something that if it was told to me, I didn't know. And if, well, it was a pretty interesting experience that we had confirmation of a name, Harriet, and a spirit come out and talk to us in the group, or at least let us know what our name was, because after that, it kind of shut down. We really didn't get too much after that. Uh, but it was interesting that they took the time uh, to spell out their first name to let us know who exactly is there. You know, one thing I want to say also, um, I don't know if you guys are fans of Ghostbusters, but it's one of my favorite movies. I was really hoping to get some symmetrical book stacking uh, over in the stacks, but it just really never happened yet. So maybe one of these days, Jessica, we'll have that, we'll have that happen to us. Um, you know, but we've had some EVPs there um, over in the children's library. It was very, very interesting with that. And we'll take some devices, not just a basic standard recorder that you see. Uh, we use, you know, some higher fidelity uh, equipment with microphones that could reach 180 degrees. And plus we attach microphones through XLR cables and place them in different areas to really try to pick up on any kind of sounds that may happen in the area. So, you know, we introduce ourselves. We'll all go through the group. Hi, my name is John. Can you tell me your name? We'll go through. Uh, we go back and we listen to see if we get any kind of responses. We did not. But one thing I did do was I said, well, if there is anyone here tonight that would like to talk to us in any such way, you have this piece of equipment. It was on a tripod. I said, you can come over. You could touch these microphones. You could talk right into them. I'm going to give you one minute of airtime. You do as you see fit. Come around. Talk into this. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. Try to do something physically in the building knock on something, tap on something, let us know. And hopefully we can go back and listen and we'll be able to hear you. So we placed it, put it down. I explained it just like that. Uh, there was a group of five or six of us that were there. We hooked it up to our loudspeaker so everybody was able to hear it. We went back and well, first thing we heard was this knocking on the wall behind us. Uh, but what's interesting about that though, we didn't know there was knocking because we didn't hear it live in real time. But going back and thinking, we had this motion light, which was behind this one gentleman. And this they have this ramp that goes in on the side door, which is a, you know, for handicap accessible uh, ramp that's there. We put these motion lights down. And the motion light turned on at one point. But what happened was when it turned on, now looking back, it lined up exactly with the time frame when we heard the knocking that came through. Um, we, let, we let it go maybe 20 seconds later, and we heard heel to toe walking. Uh, around us in that room. So we've had some pretty interesting experiences uh, with audio uh, over in the children's library, uh, over in the Albright Memorial Library itself, uh, as I explained. 
We had some pretty cool experiences and we also did get an EVP, which I think Jessica was part of this and there was something else that was happening. So I'm going to turn this over to Jessica because she can explain it a little bit better what happened because she walked around with some of the groups. And this was her experience that she had one over in in the library itself and in the stacks right and yeah. the EVP over in the children so go ahead. Yeah so so I had some interesting activity because some of the groups I would just follow around and uh, join them so uh, and this was just recently uh, back in September, the group I was with we were in the stacks um, and we were you know trying to do them like an EVP session. Uh, recording, trying to just talk, introduce ourselves. And um, we were trying, we were getting a little bit of activity um, at one point and uh, just with the motion sensor device and we're like, okay, let's do an EVP session. And there wasn't much conversation. We were just talking and then we stopped it. We played it back and this deep clear as a bell male voice came out saying, what the hell is going on? And all of us looked at each other and we're like, that wasn't you. That wasn't like none of us. None of us said that. Like there were two other guys in our group that could have potentially, but they were all. We were all right there. There was no one else around. And I even like double checked. I peeked downstairs to see if there was anyone by the stairwell. Like no one. <laughs> and so we played it back again, and it's like, yeah, Claire's a bell. What the hell is going on? It kind of sounded like a teenager, and we're just like, what? Where you know so so that was really interesting and that was like the beginning of the night so there's definitely something in the stacks but I think they're shy <laughs> um, they they don't like to come out too too much um, no the stacks actually have been some of the most benign area actually in yeah in, in the I, library itself but well that was pretty interesting when something like that happens it it is and and I mean I want that Ghostbusters you know thing to happen too like I want to see the librarian I wanted to be like one of the first librarians and be like hi but that hasn't happened yet <laughs> no not yet um now I do have a co-worker who um she did go on one of the ghost tours but prior to that and prior to any of the investigations she has seen when she's alone because she works up in reference she has seen some part of an apparition of like a puff sleeve so that's why we're thinking it's maybe uh, Hen uh, Edith Carr, Henry Carr's wife, or maybe one of the first librarians. And um, we're just trying to figure out, is she only in the reference wing? Does she go into the stacks? Does she, you know, because um, there is a back, um, a staff entrance, there's a back stairwell that leads from reference down to the stack area. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, and then the other thing that happened for me here at the Albright, which was big, was um, I think it was like the second tour that we did here. And I was following a group and we were here in the admin office trying to see if we could, you know, talk to any children's librarians or anything. And we were going nowhere. So the one group finally said, Jess, why don't you try the, the dowsing rods? Maybe they'll respond to you. I said, OK, yeah, what the heck? And you know, we're going along. And I just said, are there any Albrights here? And the dowsing rods cross. And I'm like, okay, is it John? And it was a no, which didn't surprise me because at this point he had lived in Buffalo. Turns out we got Joseph and Joseph did die in the homestead that was on this land where that library is now. And we do have some of the original blueprints and personal effects of Joseph in the homestead. Um, in our collection, and it is in the office here. So uh, then we're like, okay, maybe this truly is John's dad, it's Joseph Albright. So, you know, then I'm sharing the questions, are you happy that John did this? And absolutely, it was a yes. Um, and, you know, he was just very happy of everyone that works here and knows that we're dedicated and, you know, loves all the people that come in here. Um, he doesn't always like it when there's huge concerts next door at the cultural center, which was really funny because um, there, there was like a, a hard rock concert happening outside before we started one of the, the ghost investigations. And later that evening, I said, did you like the music? And it was a no. Dowsing rods were a new. Um, so those are really those are really interesting. And, and there have been several groups several times now that have contacted John. And it wasn't just with me. It was with my coworker when she went on an investigation. It was with some other um, non-staff members as well. So that's cool. 
um and he's he's just a he's just a nice cool chill guy you know he's he's not looking he's good um but next door at the children's library that really shocked me how much activity we had over there because i truly didn't think there was going to be too much mm. um and oh there was so one of the things that happened recently back in september was um i think it was the last investigation for the night in the group i was with we had one of the, the motion sensors on it was the behind the, the circulation desk where the staff area is there's a little counter there and we had the motion sensor on the counter on the edge and immediately that just kept going off and none of us were near it like we were all either sitting down like sitting almost like in the pews kind of or you know back a little and that thing just kept going off so we finally said okay hi how are you who are you and we were doing evp sessions we were going with the dowsing rods so finally with the dowsing rods we found out that it was a boy around eight or nine years old and pretty much that's all we got out but he just kept hitting that thing and we're like yeah we know you're you're back there but it's a section where kids are not supposed to go so it was kind of like a nanny nanny poo poo see i can go back here now and you can't do anything about it so um it was really funny and then we had to sing some of the story time songs with them um because he he knew them because he you know listens to the story time so i'm singing singing along and all of a sudden we just the dowsing rods were going crazy and the evp wasn't happening and and the motion sensor had stopped and we're like whoa what, what's going on and we were like is someone else with us and it was a yes and they're like do you want us to stop singing story time songs and it was a yes so he said do you want us to stop singing no and i'm like oh so what would you like us to sing so we found out it was a churchgoer and we ended up choosing a simple song that pretty much everyone knew amazing grace and we started to all sing amazing grace um so it's really interesting in the children's library there's a lot of song you know there's a a lot of good song vibes that come out whether it's a kid or a churchgoer um but yeah i mean i mean there are just some interesting experiences there's been even more motion sensor stories at the children's library with the fish tank that's nearby there are voices that have come through um but they're all like super nice you know they're just like yeah we like that this is a kids library because they get entertained i mean they get story times they get danger club you know all, the, all those really cool things yeah i must say out of, out of all the um interaction that we've had with uh, any of the spirits that would come out uh, everything has always been uh, friendly there's never been any time where anyone has ever felt threatened by any point at any point you know nothing ever malicious nothing like that uh, in, in both locations it's always been a happy spirit that has contacted us for sure very good i'm just jess i'm, I'm just picturing a curmudgeonly john albright sitting in the library going hey you kids get off my lawn i, I love it i, I love that <laughs> i love oh. that john albright is, is still there hanging out and delighted that his house is now a library um, yeah that's that's pretty cool. Um, Lenny, if, if I'm not putting you too much on the spot, I know you participated in some of their investigations. I wondered if you had any any stories that you wanted to share as well. I know you and Joyce participated. We were there in June. And John, when we in, were in the reference room, I was the pendulum. Yep. And uh, you asked the uh, spirit was a minor. He had been a minor. And also we had been in basement. And that's when we picked up another minor who was, he had said, open the door. Yeah, it I seemed like he'd been killed in a cave and wanted to get out. But when I was the pendulum, you did ask the spirit if he liked me. And I went forward for a yes. Very but nice. that was really interesting. Yeah. And the other last week on Thursday night, I was doing an extra tour and the library was open. A couple men went in to use the restroom and this man came out and we jokingly said, are you a ghost? He worked there and he said that in the basement, he said, sometimes it's really creepy. And he had seen spirits and cold spots. So um, it was it was a good tour that you did. And then we did one at the cultural center with you also. Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah. Uh, the doors that you're speaking of down in the basement, what she was talking about is I uh, felt that he was trapped, opened the door uh, down in that yes. room. There's a door to the right and one to the left. Uh, we went over, opened them up, uh, but it didn't change the atmosphere. Nothing happened. Nothing, you know, no, no new voices, nothing like that. But we gave it a shot. And, you know, I guess. I guess he may have been talking about one of the underground uh, mine tunnels, what you're saying, right? Yeah. yeah. I often wonder, I have a question, really. It's 
sometimes spirits, no matter what building it is, will be saying, help us, save us. And my thought was, are they trying to find a way to pass over and they don't know how to do it instead of staying there? That was my thought for you, John. That, that, that is one of the theories, um, you know, and that's not what we are. Um, you know, we are not a resolution team like that where we, we confirm, yeah. you know, the claims and we'll go and investigate. Um, you know, but there's been some cases where it's been, when we hear that a lot, we like to bring somebody in and possibly move on if we feel necessary. Um, you know, but I always like to follow it up. I don't know if you remember, like, are you okay though? They're like questions that I'll ask. Are you still okay? Like, what yes. do you need help with? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they always seem to respond in some way to let us know that it is okay, but they really can't get out exactly what they need help with, you know? I wish, yeah. wish we were able to make a little bit better communication, but um, that does happen quite a bit. Not all the time, but we do hear some helps, uh, as you know. But what do they when need we help with? The Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> when we were in the basement, also, you had seen a spirit or something at that end of the hall you were talking about by the, the uh, uh, machines. And there was another young man in our group, and he had seen something, too. And he told me, he said he was kind of like, from the time he was young, he was kind of a sensitive and could feel things and see things that other people didn't. Right. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, I do remember that situation. Um, it takes a lot to see a spirit like that. I mean, it takes a ton of energy. I mean, that's not something that you see all the time. So it's it's pretty special that so many people and so many groups have seen some sort of apparition down in that basement of a spirit manifesting because that, that's not something that's pretty common. We'll put it that way. And it's happened. Well, like I said, probably over five different groups has been able to interact. So it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting that we get that there. Yeah. And that, that office is actually um, the interlibrary loan office. <laughs> um, yeah. I haven't told all my coworkers yet. Um, <laughs> They don't now. No, I'm kidding. You may not want to. That's, that's... Eh, yeah. No, it's okay. No, but but yeah. What the the doors that he's referencing? They're they're actually really cool. They're these like orange doors that when you open them, there's like a I don't know what do you want to call it like a hallway that goes between like the foundation of the library and then like dirt and earth, and we use it for storage. So we actually have some of the stained glass windows that we had to take out when the elevator went in are down there. We have like orange cones and different things like that back there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, like, it, I don't know. I mean, it's spooky as heck, um, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's just always there. <laughs> it really is. Um, does anyone else have any, any questions or any, any comments to, to add um, from the, from the library or from other, other places? I have a question. Between groups, was there any communication of any spirits or any mobility of someone being there from the past? Did they have pre-knowledge before they went to the basement? No, um, we, we ask that all groups. So the way we do it, we'll have, we usually have four groups that go out and they'll all be on different floors. So at that time, like when we change it up every 25 minutes or so, maybe a half hour, wherever we're at, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll call the teams. Okay, teams, it's time for team one to come down to here, two, two and three, and so on. Uh, they really don't have time to stand around and talk to each other and say, oh, wait, wait, do you mm -hmm. see what happened here? It's usually pretty streamlined. Uh, they get from one point to the next. Um, so I would have to say no. I'm not saying that in passing, somebody couldn't say, oh, my God, it was crazy down there. <laughs> um, but uh no, generally no. And, and we never repeat anything. Uh, we always like people to come in uh, not knowing anything that's happened in prior investigations. We don't want to taint anybody's thought process and their mind as they're doing something like this, you know, because subconsciously you could be thinking it and you know, that's what you're thinking, you're, you're hearing and seeing these things that may not even really be there. So we never like to do that. We right. like it to be a clean investigation for everyone uh, that comes in. Uh, that's why we really don't post a whole lot of stuff that happens mm -hmm. at our locations because we want people to come and enjoy it uh, for their own, have their own personal experience. How do you uh, present it? Meaning, uh, how do you get the groups together? Do you tell them that something may be paranormal or how do you do the tour? Uh, the tour uh, itself. Um, mm -hmm. So at, at every location- The verbiage, you know. Sure, okay. yeah. So at every, every location, it's always a history uh, portion of a tour at all locations. So you get at least a 30 
uh, the 40 minute history tour. Uh, they do talk about, you know, some of the spooky stories that may happen, this, that, whatever. But what we right. do to get the people into groups is that's, well, that's what my wife does. She, my, my wife is a teacher and picks up on, um, you know, personalities and kind of figures how everybody should be work well together. So that's what she does. But what happens is, you know, after the history portion, uh, we'll take the people in the room and we'll say, okay, we show them how to use all the equipment, which is about 15 pieces of equipment that we use. And we give them kind of a, a 101 on how to use the equipment. But if they need help, they always have a two-way radio that they're able to communicate with us, talk to us, say, hey, come down, check us out. Uh, we're in this location. I need help. So after we do, after we show everybody how to use the equipment, my wife hands out a pack. It's mm -hmm. usually six people at most in a group. Uh, she'll hand out that pack with all this equipment they used and set them on their way. Is that what you were asking? Like how we get that going? Yes, exactly. You know, uh, the main point is when they experienced whatever they did experience, I wanted to know that did someone feed that in their mind. So some people automatically feel they see things or they hear things right. only from hearing it. Right. But I wanted to know if it was a natural feeling for the people without knowing. Yeah, it, it's definitely a natural feeling. Like I said, we never like to divulge any experiences that we have at any location just for that reason alone. You know, of course, when people come and get the history portion of it, there's always that one spooky story like somebody saw, you know, whatever. But we never right. get into details. There's never names that are told, uh, you know, exact things that happen. But what's cool about it, though, is... The more and more you do it, what's interesting is you, when you have the same experience over and over and over again through mm -hmm. multiple groups, and that's what we get. So that tells us that we have a spirit, a resident who's there, who does the same thing over and over again. Right. You know? so, but we never mention names. We never mention exact experiences that people have because we want them to go out and experience it on their own. But our, our favorite part, though, is when everybody's done investigating is we bring you back to the starting point and we have a debriefing. And when we do the spirit box sessions, I take notes. Um, I let them command it, but I take notes to see what kind of names we get and responses like that um, through the four groups or five groups, or however many we have that night. And it's really interesting how many times responses between group one and five all line up together or sometimes oh. even continue the same story, which is really, really interesting. You know, so it's like we're completing that whole book, that chapter, that somebody that wrote that book where they start off by introducing themselves and telling, uh, telling us something that happened to them in the past and then finish off how their, how their life ended or something. Mm -hmm. it, it's really interesting uh, how it all plays out sometimes. And so, but sometimes we get nothing. You know, I tell everybody, I said, please have an open mind. I said, you know, we go and investigate places. My wife and I, we could be there for 10 hours and absolutely nothing. You know, you right. can, you just sit there and, well, there's nothing going on. I tell everybody it's how it may be. And that happens at the Albright. Uh, we've had some mm -hmm. nights that were absolutely insane, and we couldn't believe how much stuff was going on group after group. Um, but then sometimes you're like, eh, nothing really mm -hmm. happened there. And I'm like, well, that's exactly how it is. Nobody wanted to come out and uh, communicate that day. It's just, uh, you know, how it goes. But right. I hope I was able to answer your question. You were, and you should be thankful. I'm not on one of your tours because I'm a screamer. And if I was in the basement in a flash, I'll be on the first floor. Uh, so if I heard something, but well, thank you very much. And I thought the whole program today was nice, very interesting. And I find it compelling to hear such stories. And it's uh, such a mystery to me, you know? Well, and what, what's comforting, you know, for myself anyways, um, you know, to know that there's something out there beyond our life, mm -hmm. uh, to me, is comforting to know whether, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, we don't, none of it's us hard know to rules. define. It is. Okay. Nobody knows the rules and why and how and where we go exactly. But one thing I can confirm uh, from investigating, there are cases that we've been on and stuff that you just cannot explain. We try to debunk everything. You know, why did this happen? Well, I don't know. Well, let's go look around. Is there an open window? Is there something, you know, mm -hmm. we always try to figure that out first. But one thing I will say is without a doubt, uh, we've had so many experiences that we just cannot explain that we have to chalk it up to something that is you know, paranormal, something mm -hmm. that, you know, there's some other force at play 
that's able to manipulate our equipment or leave us voices, these voice imprints. Um, so yeah, you know, it's comforting for me to know that there's something else uh, when we pass on. And that's what a lot of people, that's why a lot of people actually come to our tours. They say, you know, I'd like to get some confirmation of, is there really life after death? And I said, well, hopefully we can find out together tonight. Yeah. You know, because we don't ever tell anybody everything, like I said. <laughs> But uh, it, it, it's, it's been great, and that's what keeps us going back. Uh, and it never gets old uh, to my wife and I, ever, because there's always a new experience. That's good. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe and we'll see you on one of our tours. Lovely, we, we hope so. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely sentiment, John, to, to be looking for, for comfort, for something something else that's that's out there, rather than just, you know, something spooky and Halloween-y, um, yeah, as we, right. we tend to think of, think of spirits. Um, you know, if, if anyone is, is interested in, in joining, um, Wyoming, Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours has a Facebook page um, with all of their upcoming events on there. Um, please, please follow their follow their page and see what else is what else is going on. Um, you know, they, they did a wonderful event for us um, in the Forest Hill Cemetery um, that we, we do hope to repeat in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone would like to, to join us for that, um, that'll see, see who else is, is hanging around in, in Forest Hills um, and what else is, is going on there. Um, um, thank you again, John and, and Jess and, and Lenny too for for sharing your sharing your stories. Um, it's it's it is nice to know that uh, there are still the, the founders are benevolently looking uh, looking down on the Albright Library in Scranton. Um, it's such a such a great building. Um, it's nice to know that we have uh, we have the stamp of approval um, on one of our, our great sites in, in Scranton. So thank you again for for sharing your your stories. Um, our next program will be the week before Thanksgiving um, on Friday, November 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll be joined by uh, Pat McKnight, who's the archivist at Steamtown National Historic Site. Pat will be providing a brief overview of the archives at Steamtown and sharing some of his favorite items as well. Um, so join us on November 19th for a bit of a, a sneak peek in the ar archives at Steamtown National Historic Site. Um, otherwise, thank you again for, for joining us, uh, for sharing your stories, and just for, for being present for our, our program today. Um, and happy Halloween, everybody.